This week's episode was brought to you by Kekage54 and Josie Lucas. If you too would like to support the show, hop on over to your web browser and visit www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit, where five bucks gets you two high quality stickers, all the extended episodes and bonus content you can handle. But best of all, if you're a subscriber, you get invited to our Discord and Minecraft servers that are compatible on lots of different devices. This week, we're discussing apotheosis from traditional yogic perspectives, aligning them with esoteric philema, and discussing the ancient Egyptian anatomy of the soul. In the extended show, we discuss how these concepts relate to Spinoza's God and mathematics, but before we cut out for Patreons, we give Anton LaVey a great deal of microphone time on the same subject. So please, get comfy, thank you, and enjoy the show. It's the blunt. <laughs> <laughs> no, now you're ready, Mari. Now you're ready to become a living dog. <laughs> I have been ready, and I already am. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Whole Rabbit, where we don't just gently poke fun at Ian Quetting for getting successful selling his immortality recipes online. No, no, we ooze self-satisfaction, giving away hours for free, because today we are discussing apotheosis, or becoming a living god. Today... I'm joined by Mari Sama. Hello. And I am your host, Luke Madrid, the Hacking Rabbit. Because apotheosis is about becoming God or becoming a God or maybe even just becoming as God. It's a it's a pretty controversial topic. Right. And in my research, I've come across terms about, say, like ascending to the afterlife or heaven, quote unquote while still alive and coming back alive would be a synonymous definition with that. I don't know if Enoch would count, though, because I think he just stayed up there and became Metatron. But he's actually, I don't know, we'll get into that. The uh, Mormons think that he ascended and then came back from heaven. So the Mormons are believers in Enoch. Oh, yeah. They're so everybody knows what ascension is. So you go to heaven in your living body without having died. So in other words, you have averted death and you can transcend into the next realm without having lost your body. Anyway, in Mormonism, there's something called translation, which is similar. And there is a list of people here that they have claimed have gone to heaven and come back. They can like come back to the earth as well. That's pretty much what we're going to be discussing today because... And Enoch is on that list. OK, so they they would agree and he, that he belongs on our list of things to oh, talk correct. about in terms of apotheosis because he made it because here here's the thing, because he made it. Enoch made it. He's a winner. Winners win. And Enoch is a winner. He became so as Metatron because Metatron is basically like you could be an angel and know God pretty well. And you'd be like walking into the throne room. You'd be like, hey, God, I mean, oh, oh, it's Metatron. Sorry. Sorry, Metatron. God, I didn't mean to get. Please don't send me anywhere. Don't demote me. You know, you could make that mistake because they're pretty similar. Metatron is the voice of God. I know he exists in Hakma, So wisdom. Or maybe that's Raziel. Hey, I think he actually might exist as an eight. Yeah, I think he's the archangel of Kether, actually. So there you go. I, yeah, think, I think you're yeah. right. Yeah, it's a Semitic angel. So it's it's very old. As Raziel's the wisdom keeper, the record keeper. He's he's like but a, he's the character. voice. But Metatron's he's the voice. The voice. That speaks. Yeah. So we, I guess we just wanted to get that out of the way, because in Ethiopia, the Jews there consider the Book of Enoch to be like canon. But they're the only group of Jews, from what I could understand, that accept the Book of Enoch is like, dun, 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 this is real. Everyone else thinks it's like might be a crazy person. So the first thing I want to properly discuss in terms of apotheosis is kind of a more popular understanding of how it's achieved and how it's imagined. You can find all about this in the autobiography of Yogananda. The two people spoken of here are visible on the cover of the Beatles Sgt. Pepper's album. Uh, this is the tale of Master Sri Yuktisvar appearing to his student, Yogananda, from beyond death to impart knowledge and encouragement from the other side. Sri Yuktisvar is pretty easily found on the Pepper's album. He's positioned on the top left. Uh, he's the fellow looking stalwart with the white beard. Yogananda, his student, is also visible on the cover, but he's a tiny bit harder to find. He's the uh, chocolate skinned looking fellow with long curly hair positioned under the chin of the two people on the top right. 
Then, if you want to go even further, Sri Yuktasvar's master, Lahiri Mahayasa, is down a little bit to the left, mischievously peeking out with only his left eye, and the top of his mustache is gently riding the hair of the woman below him. Why do I mention him? Because his teacher was the great Mahavatar Babaji, who is a god and is immortal and can do whatever he pleases because he has become the avatar or simply just is Shiva. Shiva is also kind of important as it's understood to be the deity that brought yoga to earth and presides over it in his aspect of Adi Yoga. As such, the Beatles considered the following passage some straight dope. And if you're into Jedi stories or interested in the historical basis for force powers, they're called cities, not with a C, but with an S. They're an important feature of Hindu culture and literature. You can you can say some stuff, Mario, if you want to. I don't I, I don't know anything about this stuff. Like you, I said, you don't even watch Star Wars. No, I don't trust you. I'm just listening and learning <laughs> this. You should watch Star Wars and learn. I tried once and I fell asleep, so I'm not going to try again. Listen, it's much better if you if they had just committed to the story arc that Jar Jar Binks is a Sith master and he's working. To... I, I hadn't even gotten to that point. And I was oh, scared. my God. You know what? It's not that good, but that's why it's so good. I'm going to read what Yogananda said now. He's a Jedi. I know you don't know what a Jedi is, but no, no. Okay. Some kind of like age magician. Some like some like boomer renaissance like. You, know, you like pulling rabbits out of hats. Yeah, right? they're magic. They're whatever those people were in Dr. Sleep, more or less. So anyway, I'm going to read for Yogananda now. I'm going to try not to do an accent because that would just be that would just be bad. So sitting on my bed in the Bombay Hotel at three o'clock in the afternoon of June 19th, 1936, one week after the vision of Krishna. I was roused from my meditation by a beatific light. Before my open and astonished eyes, the whole room was transformed into a strange world. The sunlight transmuted into supernal splendor. Waves of rapture engulfed me as I beheld the flesh and blood form of Sri Yuktasvar. He's like stoked because this is actually like his physical master. After like after his master's dead, he's appearing to Yogananda physically with a body. That's kind of like what we were talking about in the intro, right? Sure, that you can materialize back from it. But it's interesting that yeah. he died. Though. He did die. He did a, die. A lot of time people just float into the sky or that's kind of what some scripts describe it as. That's what Jesus or that did. You, or you materialize into the to the air, which is spirit. Now, we had discussed in another episode that this being ascended into heaven means that you don't leave anything behind. Your body doesn't rot and your hair isn't even really like you, you leave behind these pearls or these what the Buddhists would call like the Buddha relics. So it could just be a metaphor. I mean, perhaps maybe it's an inspiration or the fact that your memory lives on because that's another way people become immortal is they make spiritual children and then they get statues erected for them or monuments or Ew. their ideas are written down for a long, long time. Spiritual children and erected monuments sounds really sexual, Mari. It probably is, though, because so, it's about creating it's about creating more more of yourself to stay in the material realm while you're gone. But they can't come back is the only thing. Like ugh. once you're forgotten, then then it's over, man. Gross. Sex is gross, Mari. <sighs> you're telling me. <laughs> it's just disgusting. So anyway, for the first time in my life, I did not kneel at his feet in greeting, but instantly advanced to gather him hungrily in my arms. Moment of moments, the anguish of past months was toll, accounted weightless against the torrential bliss now descending. Then Yogananda chastises Sri Yukasvar for leaving him behind, but the master defends himself by addressing his flesh and blood appearance, reminding him that he was only away for a moment. Yogananda even remarks on smelling him in a familiar way, so you can actually smell his flesh and blood body. Yes, my child, I am the same. This is a flesh and blood body. Though I see it as ethereal to your sight, it is physical. From the cosmic atoms, I created an entirely new body, exactly like the cosmic dream physical body which you laid beneath the dream sands at Puri in your dream world. I, in truth, am resurrected, not on Earth, but on an astral planet. Its inhabitants are better able than earthly humanity to meet my lofty standards, and you and your exalted ones shall someday come to be with me. Yogananda replies, Death Guru! Tell me more. 
So when I read this, like out the distinct impression, I was peering into some source material type stuff or a lens for how the West has come to interpret the Eastern mysteries. It The whole book reads like Star Wars. That's just what I'll say about that. Yogananda is pretty clear at this point. They're communicating through the shining, even though he's there in the physical body. It's mostly through their thoughts. You have read in the scriptures, Master went on, that God encased the human soul successively in three bodies. The idea or causal body, the subtle astral body, seat of man's mental and emotional natures, and the gross physical body. On earth, man is equipped with his physical senses. An astral being works with his consciousness and feelings in a body made of life trons. A causal body being remains in the blissful realm of ideas. My work is with those astral beings who are preparing to enter the causal world. Thankfully, Yogananda be like, more, because this is where it gets juicy. Like, as a now, dude is basically like, oh, I teach the people who have already mastered their astral body and their meditations in this place called Hiran Yaloka. So, Sri Yukt as far as some, some hotshot guru, even on the other side. So now he's going to discuss what happens for pretty much like normal beings that end up dead and on the other side, which is kind of what we're going for here. Not all of us are going to become living dogs. Maybe just you, Mari. Arf. Where did you even get the story? <laughs> the autobiography of Yogananda. I didn't even know who Yogananda was. It's in all the cool people bookstores. It's where you get it. books. Well, keep, keep. Keep up. Keep reading the story, though. OK, I'm almost ready for bed. OK, there are many astral planets teeming with astral beings. Master began. The inhabitants use astral planes or masses of light to travel from one planet to another faster than electricity and radioactive energies. The astral universe, made of various subtle vibrations of light and color, is hundreds times larger than the material cosmos. The entire physical creation hangs like a little solid basket under the huge luminous balloon of the astral sphere. Just as many physical suns and stars roam in space, so there are also countless astral, solar, and stellar systems. Their planets have astral suns and moons more beautiful than the physical ones. The astral luminaries resemble the aurora borealis the sunny astral aurora being more dazzling than the mild rayed moon aurora the astral day and night are longer than those of earth the astral world is infinitely beautiful clean pure and orderly there are no dead planets or barren lands the terrestrial blemishes weeds bacteria insects snakes are absent Unlike the variable climates and seasons of Earth, the astral planets maintain the even temperature of an eternal spring, with occasional luminous white snow and rain of many colored lights. The astral planets abound in opal lakes and bright seas and rainbow rivers. So, this place is basically the best, most ideal place for a rave. I was going to say, it sounds like just like a rave places where so he, he goes on to say like the places that aren't high ranuloka where he's training all like the super advanced souls like he says he like explains the rest of the astral world so he says there's millions of astral beings who have come more or less recently from the earth and also with myriads of fairies mermaids fishes animals goblins gnomes demigods and spirits all residing on different astral planets in accordance with karmic qualifications. Various spheric mansions or vibratory regions are provided for good and evil spirits. Good ones can travel freely, but evil spirits are confined to, to limited zones. In the same way that human beings live on the surface of the earth, worms inside the soil, fish in the water, birds in the air. So astral beings of different grades are assigned to suitable vibratory quarters. Among the fallen dark angels expelled from the other worlds, friction and war take place with lifetronic bombs or mental mantric vibratory rays. These beings dwell in the gloom drenched regions of the lower astral cosmos, working out their evil karma. In the vast realms above the dark astral prison, all is shining and beautiful. The astral cosmos is more naturally attuned than the earth to the divine will and plan of perfection. Every astral object is manifested primarily by the will of God and partially by the will call of astral beings. They possess the power of modifying or enhancing the grace and form of anything already created by the Lord. He has given his astral children the freedom and privilege of changing or improving at will the astral cosmos 
On Earth, a solid must be transformed into a liquid or another form through natural or chemical processes. But astral solids are changed into astral liquids, gases, or energy solely and instantly by the will of the inhabitants. The Earth is dark with warfare and murder in the sea, land, and air, my guru continued. But the astral realms know a happy harmony and equality. Okay, so this is the part where it gets really good, Mari. This is the part where you you need to really pay attention because if you've ever wanted to become a living dog or have your dog turn into a person, this is where that happens. It's not always about that. Well, what is it? No, I'm kidding. Um, but it, it's it's about realizing that God is a dog. Oh my goodness, we're gonna get blowed up for you saying that now. Whatever. He goes on to say that like trees can transform into people for a short time and people can transform into trees and flowers and that the gods come out and put on different forms like the way we would put on different outfits the way we would want to and go to a festival or a feast and the beings from higher dimensions come down and party with the beings of lower dimensions on like holidays that could be considered part of panpsychism or um, paganism even they have lower spirits and beings like naiads and dryads which are respectively forest and water spirits. Elementals are that way as well. They can be possessed by gods and used like puppets to to walk around on, on the land. I think that's the thing. If you've ever been to a really crazy rave or a mountain party, it's conceivable that you could run into somebody who just doesn't seem totally human. Like they don't know where... The, it, it's hard to explain because all these things just sound like I mean, they're probably possessed by the spirit of the festival where a spirit came down and possessed the festival. I guess. But sometimes you'll meet people that are truly weird. Like, oh, I just sort of ran up on this place. Like, I just happened upon it. They'll say that. And then they sort of act like they don't understand basic human things, but they can talk pretty well. And that's the visitor. Dude, I'm telling you, I think that stuff is for real sometimes. Like you might run into an angel or a weird reptilian or something at one of these parties if it's just popping enough. <laughs> but OK, besides besides just wacky, weird rave conspiracy theories, this is a common motif in initiation. And if we really do our digging, it seems like if you want to attain immortality, if you want to become like a living dog, then you need to be able to work with your different souls Sri Yukteswar says you have three, and he's working with the people who have mastered how to use their souls more or less. It's just they have they have more mastery to learn still. This folds into the ancient Egyptian anatomy of the soul. And once you take that into account, Thelema and the process of apotheosis through Thelema makes a bit more sense. So if we take what is spoken here in some earnest, it like I said, it relates to hermeticism. For instance, the yogic lineage, as we've mentioned here, it leads all the way back to a walking, living, kicking ass avatar of Shiva himself. The most elementary bit of digging will reveal a prototypical form of Shiva as Rudra, the stormer. The following information is in some places quoting and in other places paraphrasing the works of Oliver St. John in his works, The Limic Monographs, and his free readily available Temple of Babylon podcast, which is pretty exquisite if you're interested in learning about esoteric Thelema and separating the 93 Current from Crowley's Cult of Personality. Thelema and the 93 Current was unleashed upon the world by the activation of a funerary tablet of Ankhna Khonsu, a Theban priest of the god Mentu who lived and died during the 25th and 26th dynasties of Egypt. This is commonly referred to as the Stella of Revealing, which depicts an enthroned god and an adoring priest under the night sky of Nuit, and a winged solar disk of Hadith, or Heru Behedet. Mentu is the name of the god enthroned, and we would oftentimes or normally refer to him in Thelema as Ra Horquit. Mentu is the name of Set and his special name of Ra as the sun's heat at full strength. So the Midnight Sun. Harukuti, Horamaku, Ra Horquit are all just different spellings more or less of the same name. This is a product of Egyptian analogous thinking. 
different in many ways and alien to our linear and deeply compartmentalized disposition that most of us are used to encountering today. Mentu may be understood to be a unified form of Horus and Set, but most of Neturu, associated with major cult centers, embody the power of many gods. Thebes is derived from the Greek name of a place known to the Egyptians as Waset, and it means place of the scepter, or Was. What we term the scepter is identical to the image of the Egyptian god Set, a scepter held by all high-ranking priests. The scepter is the length of the human spine and terminates with two prongs at the base, symbolizing the dual nature of manifestation. Theology to the ancient Egyptians does not go overboard on unity as the gods are polymorphous and all manifestations in nature are dual. When manifestation is withdrawn, it is understood as the circle of Nuit, or what a fell might, might formulize as zero equals two. This is the esoteric equivalent of the Jedi and Lion King, the same voice actor, looking down upon the protagonist from above, the consciousness going back and merging with the all. Likewise, though... I had something to say. Okay, go so ahead. So, with the, with the zero equals two... I was reading about the foundations of mathematics and algebra in India, and something they taught is that duality is part of being in the physical realm. So zero goes straight to two. Like you skip, why would you skip one? Because one times one is one. So you just get an infinite one, you know, out of nothing. So you you actually need duality for reality to exist because it can't just be you. It has to be you in an environment or you and another person or. Well, this is a motif we explained and explored a little bit in our ego episode, because in those People, Jung and Freud and the rest of them, conceptualized that if you are reflecting, that's the only way you're truly conscious, is if there's some quality of two-ness and the ability to reflect. Likewise, when you're saying you can't just go from zero to an infinite one, consciousness is derived of at least two. There's got to be some reflection and perhaps even more than two, which is what the ancient Egyptians here seem to say and think. Rahorqui of Thelema is one of these immortal beings. You got Yoda, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Skat Crothers, Sri Yukasfar Mufasa, but it's Ankhna Khonsu who's coming to Earth and speaking to Alistair Crowley to deliver the Law of Thelema. The Law of Thelema is there to essentially help us work out our deal with these multiple souls so we can attain a level of immortality. That's the general consensus. The thing that gets me, though, is if you read it literally, it seems barbaric and ridiculous. It's not unlike the Ninth Gate antagonist Boris Balkan when he misrenders the Ninth Gates before dramatically self-immolating in a failed demonstration of power of the poetry's literal interpretation. As such, the Book of the Law is equally impenetrable and even dangerous when studied without the ancient poetic conceptions of the soul and duality in mind. As for Crowley's translation of the hieroglyphs on the stella, the words on the back begin, Unity uttermost showed, I adore the might of thy breath. For starters, the word breath is a translation of to fur be you which includes the plural of souls or spirits. In Kabbalah, breath, mind, and soul are pretty much interchangeable in terms summed up by the Ruach. But the Egyptian sense is a multitude of souls or spirits. And we kind of miss that in translation over here in the West. So, if you wish to gain unity with the Eternal and become the ultimate living in the Force type Jedi you always wanted to be, you get to play some inventory management with your different souls. Does this sound like fun to you? I think, like, if anyone's... This Sounds ha- boring. Uh, why do you say the B word? I mean, it sounds like putting files away. Well, what would you call it? You don't like you don't play video games. You you don't like it. You're pretty good at inventory management. You play what, the Minecraft. Categorizing, categorizing your egos. That's like having schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder. Except you're organized with it. Oh, it also sounds like having all these different personalities charted out and working with their opposites. <laughs> oh, yeah. It sounds just like somebody I know. Yeah, so it's super cool when you do it, and it's super boring when I talk. It's not me. It's her. It's it's Mari. She's a bitch. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> See, if God can do that, why can't we? Why can't we just pretend to be somebody else? Well, you know, some people just do it naturally. 
that's uh but that's how you get two. <laughs> well, I think the, they're the saying the one it's, pretends there's two instead of one. I think it's saying it's built. So you're a skeptic, I see. Skeptic, naysayer. I'm just not studied on um, um, these things. Well, okay. So to be fair, when Freud says we have a ego and a super ego in id, that's okay. But the second we start calling them souls, I mean, what is a psyche but a soul, right? What does psyche even mean? Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's what it is. So for the naysayers out there, just have an open mind, man. Just worship Satan. Because that's what some of you would just say about me anyway. That's fine. I, but I am talking about Satan in this episode because it's an older archetype that goes back to set. And if you were listening, meant to the fellow on the Stella of Revealing is a name of set. So there. And Set's kind of a separator. And so I guess he could help you separate your different souls and gain some unity from them. I guess that's what how it works. I I'm not an expert. So Mari, if it's not too boring, uh, if it's not too boring. Sorry, geez. We're gonna talk about E.A. Wallace's introduction to a special 1923 edition of The Book of the Dead, where he goes over all the different souls of what different souls and what they do. I'm excited. I am so wet right now because I spilled chai on me. Uh, Not because I'm going to read. So you got your cat, your cot, cot, your physical body or shell. It's corruptible and perishable, don't you know? Then you got your ka. That's like your devil. It's an abstract form of the person that especially signifies the vital energy. The ka dwells in the body or tomb, but in some circumstances, it may wander about at will. That sounds exciting. Huh. A sleepwalking spirit self. I think in the Matrix, when they go into the the room where they can, the simulation room where they can drop whatever the they want. Simulation, uh-huh. I that's think your car. I think that's your car because mm-hmm. it's in your mind space. I see because he tells Neo, you've never used your physical eyes before. So he's he's experiencing his cot for the first time, because as of now, he's only lived in his car, which is able to be embedded in the matrix's matrices. <laughs> oh, I see. Thought yeah. space like what you were kind of saying right there. All right. Moving on. There's more of these souls. You got your ba. Ba. Your heart soul. It's depicted as a bird with a human face and often dwells with the ka. It's able to assume a material or non-material form at will. This sounds like some Wonder Twins or something going on. Oh, it's going to get more Wonder Twinny. I don't even know what that is. It's, it's like where they can change forms and they have like a power ring. It's just an old Hanna-Barbera cartoon. Sorry. I just want to transform into Tigra and Bunny. At the same time, we won't talk about that. So you got your ob, the heart soul, which is associated with the intelligence of the heart, especially intuition or analogous thinking. And that's just ba backwards. So that's your ob. Oh, interesting. Now, vampires take a sip of coffee or blood and listen up because this next one's important to you. This one's called your kaibet or your shadow. It's like the ka, and it may be nourished by offerings, and it has an existence apart from the physical body. In fact, we talk about the spiritual body in the vampirism episode, and through rituals, it can be fed through various sacrifices and offerings. I kind of said that twice, but I'm just pointing out that it's something you can do. But it's the opposite of you. Well, it's a shadow. Right? Well, it's a shadow of you. Yeah, it's, it's a what shadow. What you lack. Mm-hmm. It's hard to say. It's sort of like your ka, but it you have to you gotta listen to the vampirism. It's episode. like your ka's evil twin. So you now your guys are triplets. Hey, don't project your strange, patriot, bizarre perspectives on the wisdom of the, I don't know, me. I don't wouldn't call it All right, evil. Then I then I'll I'll just stop talking. No, don't stop talking. I'm just saying. Then I don't don't tell me to stop. <laughs> I don't think it's evil is what I'm saying. I think evil is a bit heavy handed. No, that's not what I said, though. You totally schmodally said evil. It, OK, evil twin is a TV trope. OK, fair enough. Like it's an antagonist. I guess it's an antagonist. I guess, but it's you need it. You get tired without it. You get all drained. I think the protagonist is boring without an antagonist. Like, what's he gonna do? You know, now that we're talking about it, 
I seem to remember that there are some magicians who believe your Kai bet can be depleted through sexual overindulgence. Or subdued, perhaps. Right. So if you were on, if you're looking at the prawn all the time and you're cooming and going all the time, maybe your Kai bet's getting a little bit weaker. I don't know. I'm not an Maybe expert. you're becoming it, so it seems weaker. <laughs> Whoa. 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 So that's the Kai bit. Then you've got the coup. This sounds pretty cool. The spiritual soul off. Man, I'm becoming a dad. Jeez, I am a dad. What am I talking I about? I love dad jokes. Don't stop. Don't <laughs> stop. So gross. The spiritual soul often depicted as an ibis. And it's a soul which under no circumstances can die. It's cognate with the Jewish slash Christian idea of the holy guardian angel with the Greeks called the Egoides or shining one, which I have mispronunciated quite a few times on this show before. So this is the higher self in Jungian psychology. Yes. So it's a God. It's your own personal Godhead, which is what I would argue is how you can personally become a God is getting in touch with this aspect of yourself. It's, it's just it's just more souls in this. It's just it's just more to be had. More working parts. You gotta go full Kerbal Space Program with these souls. Because next, you have the Sakem. Power or vitality. But it's heavenly and it deals with the coups and the ka and not, excuse me, it dwells with the coups and not the cause down on Earth. It stays in heaven. It's a female noun and its cognate is Sekhmet, the lion goddess. So, kind of a big deal. Passion, probably. How you replenish yourself. Listen, just because what... Your your ego self, right? You know, just because she ruined the movie in this particular instance, the phrase, the force is feminine, would be applicable because it's related to Kali. It's related to Kundalini. It's related to the Kuti, the serpent lion goddess that we spoke of in the rabbit episode. It's a serpent force. So this is Sechem. This is related to that in some way. Hmm. Then the next one is the Ren or the name. So your name has a special power and exists even as its own soul, which is the reason why when you're a wizard, you take on a wizard name. Hmm. I need a wizard name. So that's why you can. Well, that's why Kylo Ren being heir to Darth Vader is so important and why you can be like, oh, my son is alive, but Kylo Ren is dead. All that stuff, because you're that's a soul. So it has influence over the rest of your being, your Ren, your name. Mm-hmm. Then there's there's even more souls, y'all. Sahu. Sahu is the spiritual body that springs forth from the material body and forms a habitation for the soul. It's getting complicated now. Oh, so this is just a soul house that your actual soul lives in Shh. inside your body that houses the souls, all these other souls. But this is a, specifically a soul house. Yeah, for your for your main for your main soul, which I don't even know what that is yet. You got a few, right? Already, you got at least your ka. You got at least so, so it's your like so- a cocoon. Your it's so- like a cocoon or like an aura of your soul that holds it all together. Maybe it's like some glue for the material body that also it's like the glue between your material body and the souls that dwell in the earthly realm. Oh. We don't know for sure because we're not ancient Egyptian priests, but we can do our best. Now, the next one's important to Thelema, and it's the Cobbs or the Star of Da'at. It's not named by Budge, but is declared by Iwas as the Cobbs is in the Ku, not the Ku is in the Cobbs. So the star is in the soul, not the soul is in the star. Hashtag think about it. Hmm. No, seriously. Right. Okay. I'm going to go into this later is that there's a hierarchy to the worlds. And you're talking about the material worlds and the spirit worlds. And there's fractals of different worlds and souls in each one, like shells. Yes. That's what it's saying is that you can't violate the higher foundational structure. So you have parents and children. Like, okay, when you're programming in programming language, you have a script that has to run for all other scripts to, to function. Okay. So one script is a child of the parent script. And mm. in order for that, like if you run the child script without the context of the parent script, it won't work. And that's what, that's what my argument is, is that this is like the inherent structure of the universe. So you can become a God, but you have to align yourself within this higher structure. There are hierarchies. 
So you do like it doesn't matter how high you get on the scale. It's it it's irrelevant. Size is irrelevant. The how much power your soul has or how much influence you have is irrelevant because it goes up infinitely and it goes and it regresses downward inf- infinitely. And so that's kind of where I come in and and kind of say that like you can't violate the up and down hierarchy of that, but it's infinite. So you could in a in a in a way call yourself a god of your immediate vicinity because you are. Yeah, I think that was a big part of how they thought of perhaps themselves as stars in the body of new elite or had the potential to ascend to that stardom. They didn't correct. It's a, it's a higher awareness. It's like the highest awareness you can attain. They didn't in that body. They didn't think in analogies in terms of computers, but I'm sure they had the stars and plants and animals and that's how they presented it. So to us, we would think of it as like, you know, like what you said, uh, subscripts and whatnot, but yes, I generally agree. Then there's the last soul here. It's called the Ekar, and it's na- a noun. Its verb principally means to soar or fly through the air as a bird. Also, it has the meaning of reaching out, which is what the priest is doing on the Stella. It can also mean shining, fire, or spirit, which in essence is used to unite the Ka, the Ba, and the Ku. So the Ka is able to freely travel to any world at will. So that's the immortality we're talking about, is if you get all your souls OP enough and you get your Ekar really fired up, you can unite the important parts of your soul together, which is your earthly double, your heart soul, it looks like. And I think your Ku is like your soul. And then your cobs, no, your higher, your higher self. Yeah, and then your cobs is within that, so presumably it would be there as well, and you'd have four, which is kind of interesting if you consider the four elements. I would argue that this is a awareness level of awareness. Sure. So, in, the more you increase your awareness, the more the more power you like. The more your your ego would expand, not ego, but your consciousness expands. The more you are aware. You become spiritually larger, quote unquote, in a in a way. And you have some so you have some maths about this? Oh yeah. Oh, this is badass. Well, guess what? If you are interested in that big, huge conversation we're gonna have, you're probably gonna have to fork over five bucks at www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit to get the full extended episode because for the free episode, I would like to talk about LeVay and Satanism and what Anton LeVay has to say about becoming a living god. Because- and then we'll go into some of the uh nerd mathematics and nerd stuff yeah <laughs> as they say on last podcast nerd alert nerd alert are we gonna do shinto if we have time in the second hour we'll talk shinto otherwise it'd be cool to have a whole episode but let's get on to it for the free show let's talk a little bit about this is anton levay near the end of his career after aquino has moved away and he's not taking credit for his writings anymore this is him speaking in his own words it's very Cool. He has some very interesting perspectives on how to become a god because in his, in essence, he's an atheist and he believes that life is the great indulgence and death is the great abstinence. So from this perspective, it's quite interesting. And I wanted to provide this for the free show because a lot of my listeners are Satanists, I think. And some of them are Christians too. So whatever, man. Well, you can't have, you know, one without the other. We don't just cater to one group, but this episode is very heavy on set and Satan and ideas that are central to the church of Satan. And so I did something cool. I did realize earlier is that all of those figures you were talking about are the light bringers, including Satan or Lucifer. And they bring intelligence to humankind that are kept guard by the gods. So if you are not all about the nerd and the high minded file cabinet way of dealing with your souls, just listen to the following Anton LaVey say this. Don't advertise. Just let your presence be known. Never under any circumstances go around proclaiming yourself the devil. Others must recognize you as such. The reason the God of Christians, the fiction known as Christ, doesn't make regular appearances at concerts, book signing parties, or backyard barbecues is because he doesn't have to. There are plenty of followers who will advertise his existence for him, not to mention attesting to personal acquaintanceship. If you are a first-rate devil, others will do your advertising for you. Whether you ask for it or not, two, never be fashionable. Always be mysterious and enigmatic. Remember, man follows his gods, and his gods are never trendy. You never met a god who wanted to be one of the crowd. 
That's why it has been said that the Lord works in mysterious ways or why an unexpected catastrophe is called an act of God. So don't follow the trends. So that so number three, you must be creative. Take inspiration from the most sordid sources if necessary, but never imitate. Rip-off artists cannot proclaim themselves divinities because they lack the originality or creativity to come up with fresh ideas, let alone new worlds. Four, you must have class. Be reserved. Show some restraint. If you can't be decorous around other people, how can you maintain order and control? Five, a sense of humor is a must. A dog who can't laugh at himself or find comic relief is a dull Jehovah and most definitely unsatanic. You wouldn't want to be unsatanic, would you? That would just be. So if you want to be unsatanic. I think I am a sa- Satanist at this point. Just don't have a sense of humor. That's the most important part if you want to avoid being Satanist. The next one's also pretty important. You have to harbor some doubt even about yourself. <laughs> I'll just you can read that one for yourself. Seven. Be aware of your own mortality. Understand that gods have been proclaimed dead many times throughout history. That's why they have Valhallas and Avalons and lands like Nod, east of Eden. So he's like, he takes a very cynical view of what we just read. You must be perceptive enough to see the things as they really are, not how you might have been taught by others or who stand to gain from your ignorance. Yet, to better understand the ways of man and deal with him, you must be able to suspend your awareness of what's really happening and see things through his eyes. In other words, learn to be stupid. It will serve you best. Be merciful, especially when you're happy, but cruel if you're pissed off. If you really wield any power, people will realize the benefits gained through contributing to your happiness or tough luck that can befall them by gaining you sore or getting you sore, I should say. So that's how you become a god, according to the the actual Church of Satan dude. Like that's well, holy fuck. I guess I'm doing it all right because these are things to live by, at least for me. Well, sh- well, to be fair, Anton Levey has. I think one of his most insightful predictions was that the religions, like specifically the Roman Catholic Church, would continue to modernize and modernize and modernize their ideas to the point where they they said years ago that if you're just a good atheist, you're going to go to heaven. He said that. Who cares? That's exactly what he said. He said, so just become a Satanist already. We're having more fun anyway. Like, why are you why are you going to like wade in slowly and go with the masses and get like the watered down stuff? Just come over and just do it already. Which and is, I honestly have no problem with their doctrine at all. Well, that's it just bes- depends. It's up to the user to me. Like, how responsible is the user and what do they want? That's really what the outcome is. You know, if you use it for dumb shit, then it it may not be the best thing. But it'll get you what you you what you want. But if you use it to attain godhood, it could it could actually work for you because, I mean, these tenants are very, very smart to live by. And he also warns you not to uh, to use other souls that are lesser than you. There's a part in Satanism where you you're not supposed to harm things that are less intelligent than you. It's it makes you seem weak. Exactly, and but that's what I'm saying. A good leader knows not to do that knows not to take advantage because they're not a coward. They don't need to do that. They can be overt in their control. Anton LaVey stuck with his whole God is just an idea bit for his whole life. And he never really believed in a theological basis for God or Satan. He never actually believed in a spirit of Satan, despite having dogmas and theater and ritual. He is just a big troll. (laughs) Essentially, yes. But a lot of his followers disagreed and they founded the temple of set which i did do research mm. for and some of it is so redundant but also not redundant it it deserves its own episode i want to talk a little bit more anton levey for the free show dude i get all excited reading anton levey i really like him i don't know about his i mean i do i do too but he teaches you not to follow trends and not to follow people so i'm not a satanist for that reason but I really like his work. I've met. Pe- and the, yes. Mm-hmm. And the Bible that like all the shit he wrote is actually pretty on point. But it doesn't end there. The next section is probably even better. The subsection here is named erotic crystallization inertia. Whoa. Sounds technical. Whoa. Bro. Whoa, Come bro. On. Is this Steven Universe porn? Nerd alert. Dude, if you listen to his music recommendations, they're like Flight of the Valkyries is on there and Holtz. And this dude did not warm up to rock and roll until he was nearly dead. He was like, this is crap. You know, he was really into the classics. 
That which is pleasing to the eyes gives joy, and joy gives strength, and strength gives life. We receive pleasure in many ways and by diverse means, but the most conscious of all is through eye appeal. Man is a visually oriented animal. He establishes standards of visual attractiveness of an inflexible nature. If the standards he has set forth for beauty are modified by fashion or social change, he will never be quite as happy as before the change took place. As he grows older and styles changed more, he will cling to the substance of his joy by retreating into social circles where he might reminisce of what once made him happy. In this way, he remains in his vitality, albeit vicariously. With his cronies, he will talk of the good old days, days replete with the sights so dear to him. Now, so sadly changed, his pals and the elderly girls who abound in the old compound share his nostalgia, and their clothing is out of style. Out of style! How fortunate for the inmates of senior citizen centers that they can maintain at least some semblance of the good old days, if only on their backs. Little do they realize that this very outdatedness is keeping them alive. How often is it seen that when an aging person loses interest in life, when his children have grown up and his vitality decreases, he will enter a retirement community and suddenly become revitalized. I don't know if that's true. That's true. Is it true? It is. Oh, they fuck like rabbits. Okay, so I'm not. That's okay. Moving on. That's that's I, I'm happy that's true. Theoretically, it would be assumed that such an atmosphere would hasten the death process and to the inertia of old age. Why does the opposite invariably occur? Because the aging person is suddenly thrown into a controlled environment, one where there is more visual imagery conducive to his excitement and enthusiasm than in the outside world, stylishly out of style. It becomes fun for the cadres to look at each other, much as it must have been fun in their younger days. Aww. The boys gazing with lust at the girls and the girls longing for the boys. And what about the small towns, those places bypassed by the freeways where octogenarians dominate the landscape the little jerkwater towns where nobody ever seems to die where they all seem too crotchety over what is going on in the world fighting over any change that will alter the visual landscape and only accepting that which promises freedom from pain illness and death from a visual point of view these places are completely inert cars are 20 years old no buildings are ever torn down much time is spent on porches and back benches around pot-bellied stoves at the bus depot, wherever there's something to be seen. And what is seen? The same things that have always been seen. The inhabitants of such a place might not live to be 100 years old, although there exist such environments in which numbers of incredibly old people are abound. It appears certain, however... That in static environments, there are more old people per capita than within the constantly changing scene. It will be argued that it is natural for old people to live in such places where it is stifling to young persons. This is true, but it need not be. The main reason for young people leaving such environments is because they can't cope with old farts. The old folks feel equally disdainful of the progress quote unquote, that is manifested in youthful styles, fully as alien to their visual joy associations as their stodginess is to the young. Under such conflicting standards of visual exhilaration, no one can be nearly so happy as if a total, compatible, visual atmosphere were to prevail. Let us not forget that the young of today are crystallizing their own visual standards of beauty. Soon enough, they will become the old fogies. In time, they will band together in retirement communities in old people's homes, reminiscing of the surrounding themselves with accoutrements of their youth. Places where people live longest are space-time warps. They could live even longer if young people dressed and looked exactly like themselves. The chronological change that accompanies style change is the culprit here. With each new advance in medical science, there's a setback, another way insofar as longevity is concerned. While men of science discover cures, they also discover means of communication and travel that open wide the very isolation and harbors uniquely collective existences. Thus, shingle laws are turned into Manhattans, and germ-laden dying 90-year-olds are turned into germ-free, smog-smothered, anxiety-ridden dying 60-year-olds. Just as fashion centers of the world promote a quick death, so unchanging environments exist as hubs of longevity. The most deadly lie is the half-truth, and the fashion industry has perpetuated one of the most eloquent of all, namely that a fresh new approach is what keeps one young. The fresh approach does keep one young. If the person is fresh, 
young and vital in spirit, the freshest thing that an old man can see is a pretty girl dressed in a manner that is reminiscent of his youthful erotic crystallization, erotically stimulating, but also emotionally acceptable. Likewise, an elderly lady will zestfully witness a handsome young man fresh young blood, attired in the manner of the suitors she once attracted. She can and does vicariously maintain an aura of attractiveness when confronted by such a man. And it is this very aura, constantly recharged, that will res- that will sustain her very life. What? Is he talking about mm. Ka- is he talking about Karen right now? He's talking about cougars. What? Uh, I know my life path. So is that why if I dress like Mr. Rogers, they come after me? Mm-hmm. So this you is, look older than you than you are actually are. You look younger than you are. So. But I dress like an older person sometimes. So when I drive, wow. I have like a tie and they just like are like, hmm. So Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because people our age don't do that. No. They're what, like, I don't have a job interview. Oh, well, I don't have to wear a tie. So there's some truth to this. When the world one loves is seen as dying, the viewer dies a little with it. The great American painter, Reynold Marsh, exemplifies this truism. Every day until his death at the age of 56, he sketched and painted the most earthly, sweaty, and lusty examples of humanity he could lay his eyes upon. His, oh my. his productive voyeurism led him through the entire spectrum of cheap cafes, carnivals, amusement parks, skid rows, exclusive clubs, opera openings, coming out parties, and everything in between. His super realistic canvases were jammed with the kind of people he loved to watch and the environments he loved to haunt. As his closing years approached, Reynold Marsh grew depressed at the changing scene. It's Reginald. Fuck. Thank you. Jesus. New styles were emerging, and it now became more difficult to immerse himself in the vices from which he had so long drawn, both in his paintings and life himself. His canvases of lumpy women and pot-bellied men were too unappealing for the think-thin era of the 50s, and his fl- huh. and his floozies violated the then-current Grace Kelly ivory soap look. His disdain for modern masters, Matisse draws like a three-year-old Picasso, a false front became exemplified as he summed up modern art as high and pure and sterile. No sex, no drink, no muscles. Marsh, out of date, feeling reached its zenith when he was asked to take part in an art symposium. This first speaker, who was a then popular New York painter, enthusiastically championed current trends. Then followed a professor who advocated new and dynamic experimentation in the visual field. At last, it was Reginald Marsh's turn to speak. He stood on the platform for a moment as if trying to collect his thoughts. A sad look of resignation appeared in his eyes as he gazed down at the audience. The talented watcher of his innermost secret lusts and life-giving scintillations declared softly, I am not a man of this century, and sat down. He died shortly wow. thereafter. Yeah. Anyone who is satisfied with the way things are going is reluctant to change his mode of living. This includes style, fashion, and environment. Man is the only animal who has been carefully taught to be discontent. What is even worse, man is the only animal who has been educated on one hand to be discontented while religion has programmed him to remain static, inert, and complacent. Small wonder he is such a mass of frustrations. If he is content with the way things are, the priests of fashion and change coerce him into unwilling and unnecessary modification. If he is a malcontent who wishes to escape from the world he feels is shortchanging him, he is told to accept things the way they are. Be thankful for small favors and await his better life in a future paradise. Well, that's a pretty good story. So something I saw about or that I thought about this it seems like your attitude is really what your real age is and how how you come at the world how you deal with it yes it, I, and how you deal with change honestly it seems yeah how you deal with change but also how you stay within your own bubble so to speak that makes you the most vital no matter what that you stay in your heyday people tend to stay in the time where they're like at their peak and they, they're not interested in exploring anything outside of that. I have a really interesting story. I was visiting my friends last week and I told one of my one of the guys that hangs out there. His name is Chris. I was talking to him and he has gray hair. You know, he looks like an older gentleman. Um, I told him I turned 33 and it, it actually does feel different now. But he's like, it's all attitude. He told me straight up, it's all attitude because 
when he was 13 or like 12 or 13, a handful, like three or four of his friends died of cancer and they like played in the baseball team with him at school and stuff when he was a child. So when that happens to you, when a child dies in front of you when you're that age, he started living life to the fullest. He was not afraid of death anymore. He was not afraid of change anymore. I was like standing there talking to him. I'm like, wow, that's a crazy story. And I'm like, yeah, you're really cool. And you're, you hang out with all of us and you're pretty old, right? Like, how old are you? He's like, guess. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I was going to be nice. I was going to be nice and like late forties. He's like smiled really big. He's like, nope, but thank you. <laughs> and wow. then I went fifties. Nope. Sixties. Nope. And I kind of like stopped after that dude's probably like in his seventies somewhere. I don't, I cannot believe if he's 80, but this guy is working every day, lifting stuff, hanging out with kids, just, you know, doing living life. And that's what he told me. He's like, don't ever let your mind get in the way of saying that I'm too old for this, or I'm not interested in change. I'm not interested in trying something new is because that's pretty much how he survives for so long. And he still looks young. Like he has physical vitality, not just mental. I'm curious. Did he also work or have a job? I mean, he works for my, my buddy who's a contractor. So he just does physical labor. He does electricity engineering. He does his own hobbies. He's very mentally active. Okay, so the fellow I was so the fellow I was talking about on the cover of the Sgt. Pepper's album, Lahiri Mahayasa, mm-hmm. that was Sri Yukta's Far's teacher. Oh yeah, yeah. Lahiri Mahayasa was taught by the great Babaji himself, so he's kind of important. And you know, Lahiri Mahayasa's karma was to come and teach that you could do this yoga and have a job and have a wife and have a life. So get back to work, folks. In both the esoteric and the not so esoteric sense, but whatever you do, eat carrots and shoot lasers. 